Fell Seal Arbiter's Mark is a turn-based tactical RPG that is heavily inspired by a classic of the genre, Final Fantasy Tactics. The key similarity between the two games is the class system used to design the player's party members, although they don't end there. If you are a fan of this system, or have a significant nostalgia towards the classic title, I would definitely recommend picking up this game. It will be worth every penny for you. If you aren't sold yet or have no inclination as to what Final Fantasy Tactics is, but are a fan of the genre, the rest of this video is for you. The beginning will serve as a spoiler-free introduction and will eventually transition to a more in-depth look of the game's mechanics and story. If you're one of those people who hears the word turn-based combat and immediately shudders, I definitely do not recommend this title as I understand the genre, much like any game, isn't for everyone. For people that are on the fence, or just want to hear some random nerd on YouTube's opinion, relax. I've got you. This video will be highlighting two fundamental aspects of Felseal, its gameplay and its narrative. Felseal takes place in Tiora, a world that was once ravaged by a demonic beast known as the Maw. A group of seven individuals defeat the beast and gain immortality. They are then dubbed the Immortals, the most awe-inspiring and original name my ears have ever had the good grace of hearing. With their newfound power, they do what anyone would do, live a life filled with debauchery with plenty of blackjack and hookers. Wait, hold on, it says here they enforce their iron will on the people to ensure a threat similar to the Maw never rose again. Damn, that's boring. I like my version better. Anyway, the game opens up with one of these immortals deciding to give up his right to infinite amounts of blackjack for, uh... Ah yes, the timeless classic. Reasons. A new immortal must be chosen through a process where each leader chooses someone to partake in a pilgrimage to crown the new immortal by visiting four temples and draining some of the dark energy in the relics housed there. These candidates are selected from a group of people called Arbiters, who help further enforce the Council's iron will by essentially acting as the police. However, they can forego the modern-day justice system and do whatever they deem fit as long as it adheres to the Immortals' policies. It should come as no surprise that these Arbiters are easily corrupted by the absurd amount of power they are given. The main heroine is Kairi, an Arbiter who begins every day with a steaming hot bowl of kick-ass injustice with a side of rocks. Basically, she's the only non-corrupt Arbiter for miles. Of course, Kairi gets chosen to become a candidate for the vacant Immortal position. Kairi, along with her ragtag group of Arbiters, set out to shackle the people under the tyranny of the Immortals. I mean, uh, ENFORCE JUSTICE! Or something. I don't know. The other Arbiters I mentioned are a combination of original story characters and random player-created characters, although it's up to the player on who gets to participate in combat. Speaking of combat, how about we transition to the gameplay? At the core of Felseal's gameplay are classes. For those unfamiliar with the system tactics uses, I'll explain. The system works like two sets of trees, one more magic-based starting with the Mender class, and another more physically oriented called the Mercenary. Every class has abilities and two skills that can be unlocked through a character equipping the class in their primary slot. When an encounter is completed, all participants receive ability points which are then spent on the abilities a class offers. Acquiring abilities for a class allows that specific character to have access to more advanced classes. For instance, once you get the second Mercenary ability, or reach Mercenary Rank 2, that character has access to the Scoundrel class. This system snowballs, leading to classes you unlock becoming requirements for even more advanced classes. You may have noticed earlier I mentioned Primary Slot. That's because every single character has the ability to have two classes equipped one primary, and another secondary. However, the second class does not gain any ability points while equipped. There are a total of 20 base classes in the game with some story character specific ones, as well as 6 unique classes for player created characters. Every class feels fairly unique with every option having its own unique stat growth, weapons and armor it can equip, and abilities. The main boon of this system is the amount of freedom it grants the player on how to build their party. Even story characters can be built in any way you want them to be. In terms of actual turn-by-turn -turn combat, most maps allow 6 party members per encounter, and each character is allowed to move and perform one action per turn on a grid-based map. Much like any turn-based tactical RPG, the positioning of your units matters. Felsil takes some inspiration from tactics again by utilizing a similar set of rules in regards to positioning. In tactics, whenever a party member performs an offensive action, the chance of it connecting is calculated based on where you are attacking from. Attacking from the front grants the lowest chance while performing the action from the side increases it. The odds are at their best when attempting the action from behind the foe. Felsil has the same core mechanics in place with the key difference being the damage dealt being increased rather than the chance of landing the blow. I prefer the way Felsil handles this mechanic mainly because I don't think RNG should play a large role in a game that is centered around using strategy to defeat your opponent. How did I miss that? I had a 95% chance to hit. I deserve that damage. You know what? Forget this game. Forget the video. I'm done. I'm done.
So it turns out I spent way too much time playing this game, uh, and uh, it would kind of just be a waste of time not to make the video, so uh, we're gonna continue. Anyway, the point of this concept is to add another element the player must consider while navigating through an encounter. This is easily achieved, and while the idea is nothing revolutionary, it definitely enhances the overall experience by a significant margin. Besides just inflicted damage and healing your units, the game offers a variety of debuffs and buffs that can be placed on an enemy or ally. Some of these include Poison, Slow, Bleed, Haste, Defense Up, you get the picture. All of these are pretty standard, and there isn't any unique status effect that sets the game apart from any other title. Performing these various actions grants the player experience. The catch is, the action actually has to do something. If a party member with full health is healed, the healer receives no experience. Leveling up works in sets of 100. Whenever a member gains 100 experience, they level up, and the amount of experience they have returns to zero. They advance their level whenever they reach 100 again. Any extra experience gained past the 100 mark does not carry over to the next level. This can lead to you wanting a specific ally to perform a task that grants more experience, such as killing an enemy, so your units get the most out of that action. The game also has a plethora of gear for your team to equip, which can either be crafted using items called components or purchased from shops. The majority of the time you will be using your funds to purchase gear as I rarely found myself crafting new things for my party members to wear. The tools you will be purchasing are yet again your run-of-the-mill items that increase a unit's stats. You can buy various weapons, types of armor, shields, and accessories. Something that is unique to Felseal is how it handles items used in combat. The player cannot buy any potions or other miscellaneous items in stores. Instead, they start with a set amount of items and must use the crafting system to gain new ones, improve their effects, and increase the amount you can use. This works fairly well because all of these items reset at the beginning of every encounter, meaning you never have to make new ones. I enjoy this system because it forces the player to utilize the tools they have available to them. It completely removes the hoarding of items that you constantly tell yourself you will use eventually, only for them to collect dust in your inventory. Instead, these items can play a role in every encounter, and since you never have an abundance of them, the decision to use an item can hold significant weight. Everything I've mentioned is meant to be a spoiler-free introduction to the game. When it comes to my opinion, Felseal's story isn't anything special. The characters are rather bland, lacking any real depth or complexity, and overall the narrative is forgettable. Where Felseal shines is the freedom to design its characters and its combat. I enjoyed the loop of unlocking a class to see what new abilities it gave me and then using this information to see how it synchronized with other classes. This led to a wide variety of personally styled characters that each had their own unique niche in combat. However, as the game reaches its last arc, this appeal dies out as your characters no longer need any more skills to achieve their purpose in combat. Without a strong story to carry the end, the game drags and made it challenging for me to find joy in its conclusion. Overall, I would recommend this game to anyone that is a fan of the genre's turn-based combat, but if you're looking for an interesting narrative, this is not a game for you. This is my spoiler warning. The remainder of this video is meant to be a more in-depth look at the game that will spoil large portions of Felseal Arbiter's Mark. With that out of the way, I will be focusing primarily on gameplay, and then transition to the story at the end. I've spent a large portion of this video highlighting the class system, so I'm going to continue with that subject. A primary joy of Felseal is the pattern of unlocking classes and seeing the new options available for a character. An important aspect to this customization are the two skills a class offers. When equipping a class in a character's primary slot, the two skills it has are automatically equipped and cannot be changed. However, every member has the ability to equip two other skills that they have unlocked from any other class. Basically, you want to build a party member where all of these skills combo well together. This in combination with the weapons and abilities a class offers allows you to create truly unique characters that excel at their given role. Felseal has such a large amount of classes that the possibilities for an ally can become feel extraordinary. For instance, you can create a dual wielding gunner that has a high chance of landing a critical hit. This build works well because you are performing two attacks which are both going to be critical hits, inflicting large amounts of damage. It also combos well with the abilities of the gunner class which is focused on placing status effects on enemies from a range. If a character lands a critical hit, they automatically inflict the status effect they were attempting. Since the crit chance is so high, they will land any effect they want. An example that focuses more on abilities and equipment is the Vampire War Mage combination. Both classes focus on dealing physical and magical damage. Where this combo shines is the Vampire's ability to use ranged weapons, such as guns or a bow. 
This in combination with the War Mage's infused edge ability, which deals both a regular attack and any spell the character knows works extremely well, because the range of an infused edge is the same as the weapon of the character. This means you can do extreme amounts of damage while being a large distance away from the enemy. These examples only brush the surface of what you can achieve in this game. All the options available to the player are truly overwhelming, and you can get lost in deciphering the hieroglyphics that is the class system. Sadly, this is where we get off the hype train. The class system is definitely a major feather in Felsfield's cap, however it isn't perfect. A key issue is switching to another class that doesn't align with your character's current build. The problem is the equipment, abilities, or skills a class gives you access to are the focal points on how you build a character. Often there is a skill you want your party member to acquire that is only accessible through a class that has nothing to do with the role of that ally. This issue can be solved through the use of secondary classes and the ability to equip any two skills, but not always. Since the gear a character can equip is tied to its primary class, if the weapon being used is not available to the new class, it can ruin the ally. Also, that unit is still being deprived of some of the skills or abilities that made that character perform their desired task. This can become extremely frustrating and inconvenient to the player. Damaging the allies you use hurts your team's overall effectiveness because this unit isn't performing as well as they normally would. Admittedly, this isn't a huge issue at the beginning of the game. Testing out different class combinations is a part of the experience, and the beginning is forgiving enough to allow it. It only becomes a real issue towards the midpoint of the game where characters have a more defined role and the challenge is increased. Let's return to the Gunner class as an example. The Gunner is a more advanced class in Felseal and it requires a character to have advanced through parts of the Ranger, Mercenary, and Knight classes to become available to a character. The traditional path is for the Ranger to advance to the Gunner class as both are based around doing damage from a distance. However, the Knight and Mercenary class cannot access any ranged weapons, and the abilities of the Ranger aren't nearly as useful if they aren't attacking from a distance. This leads to the Ranger becoming fairly useless, or forcing the unit to use a different playstyle the player does not desire, until they reach the amount of experience in both classes to unlock Gunner. The game does attempt to address this issue by providing all characters some ability points to a class whenever another member of the party gains points in that class. Basically, if a party member of the wizard class gains ability points, every other character gains minuscule points as well, regardless if they were in combat or have the class unlocked. I believe this is a great idea, and does help mitigate the issue, but it doesn't solve it entirely. This is because the ability points obtained through this mechanic are fairly low, meaning a character may only gain a single ability from the class, forcing them to use the undesired class for a fair amount of encounters. I do believe forcing a unit to use a class that doesn't suit its playstyle is something that cannot be avoided and isn't a bad thing in moderation. The biggest problem is, party members do not receive enough ability points through other units having the class equipped. One ability simply isn't enough when some classes require a character to unlock a large portion of the tree to get the desired skill. The simple solution would be to increase the amount of ability points gained through allies, and I agree with this, but only in moderation. If the amount is inflated too much, party members will finish acquiring everything they need to function too quickly, an issue that already exists towards the end of the game. Moving on past the class system, I feel it's worth mentioning the general layout of the maps and how they affect combat. As mentioned previously, all the maps are divided into a grid that characters move around on. It is important to have these maps feel distinct from one another so the game doesn't feel as if the player is going through the same encounter over and over again. Felseal does achieve this goal, at least in terms of the terrain. Oftentimes the maps not only look visually distinct from one another, but have some kind of unique feature that separates it from the others. This is done through the varying forms of terrain found throughout the game and how it's used in combination with the enemy placement. An example is Drake's Mouth Seaway, where these gunner triplets are placed in an elevated position. This may seem simple, but it does have a big impact on the encounter. The use of terrain allows them to inflict damage and status effects from a position that the player cannot easily get to since most party members will not have the ability to jump to their position, and instead will need to take the stairs. This becomes quite challenging when all of the other enemies laid throughout the map are stopping you from doing this, giving the triplets free reign over your units. This forces the player to change their strategy if they hope to overcome the challenge. This is all pretty standard for most turn-based tactical RPGs, but the consistency in which Felsio pulls this off is what makes it special. The game is great at creating these unique feeling experiences that always leave me feeling satisfied with the combat. There are plenty of other features Felseal utilizes comparable to the triplets. Some examples are, using pillars to stop enemies from charging you from across the map, surrounding a player with water which can insta-kill characters that cannot swim, using poisonous water to hinder the player's movement, or splitting up the party in two separate groups to add additional challenge. All of these situations provide the player with different forms of hurdles that feel like a breath of fresh air. One aspect of the maps and enemy placement that could be seen as a bad thing is they don't require you to use different characters to overcome these various scenarios. 
If you build your party well, you never have to stop using the same six characters throughout the game. The answer to all of the situations listed is to equip gear that lets you solve the problem or traverse the terrain in a strategic manner. If poison water is a problem, all you have to do is equip armor that allows your characters to swim if they can't already, and something that makes them resist poison. Boom. It's not even an obstacle anymore. Although I don't think this is a bad thing because the game doesn't provide the proper incentive to have extra party members keep pace with your primary members. Keep in mind that characters can only gain levels by participating in combat. If they don't, they will quickly fall behind the pack, and their usefulness will deteriorate. Since only six party members can participate in most fights, and if it is a story encounter one of those members must always be Kyrie, people are going to fall behind. I found it to be far more convenient to focus solely on six main characters rather than waste time grinding to ensure every ally was on par with one another. The game does give the player the option to recruit new units at the same level of Kyrie to help alleviate this problem, and even lets you pick what class they start as. However, these new recruits only have the meager ability points that all party members have from other allies using classes. This leads to the new characters being the same level as all the others but lacking the skills to be truly useful. The player is then left with no choice but to grind this unit if they wish to utilize them. Felseal does attempt to get you to use other party members through a mechanic called injuries. Injuries are something a party member suffers whenever they die in combat. These wounds cause the character to lose a percentage of their stats until it is healed. These injuries can stack up to 5 and for every one a character receives they lose more of their stats. The only way for a unit to heal is by having them sit out of an encounter for each injury they incur. In theory, this system sounds like it would work. Switching in extra units to replace injured ones almost forces the player to equally distribute the experience. However, in practice it doesn't. The main reason is, unless you crank the difficulty up, the game is easy enough that your characters will hardly perish, especially if you are used to playing games like Felseal. On my first playthrough, I played Felsio on Veteran Difficulty, which despite its name is actually the normal mode. About two-thirds of the game I found it to be too easy and cranked up the challenge by using the difficulty customization settings provided. More on that later. The point is, I hardly ever had any injuries up until this point and never had to stop using my original party. Once I pushed up the difficulty and got to the latter section of the game, it became a given that at least one member would die per encounter. I would actually chalk this up to the game becoming more challenging in the later sections. The issue is, I have been using the same six party members throughout the entire game and didn't even have replacement units anywhere near their level. This sounds like it could have led to a problem, but it didn't. The reason is, you can go to an older encounter and speed through the lower level enemies without your injured party members. You don't even need to use a weaker character as a replacement for the encounter. Due to this, I see injuries as more of a minor inconvenience, rather than the main drive towards using extra units and a failure in terms of execution. Something Felsi was lacking is variety in its objectives. The encounters themselves are usually carried by the different terrains, well done enemy placement, and how these foes coordinate with one another to formulate a strategy. The primary goal of every encounter is usually just to kill all the enemies. Now this issue isn't game breaking, and Felsi's encounters are still enjoyable. However, adding more optional side objectives or an additional mechanic to a level would have brought further variety. That's not to say the game doesn't try this at all. One of the very first encounters has a tile that will spawn a new enemy if a unit is not on top of it the turn this event triggers. This concept isn't anything special, but it forces the player to consider this problem and plan on how they intend on dealing with it. Another example is forcing the player to escape the area before a certain number of turns goes by. Yet again this pressures the player to adapt to the current situation and forces them to play differently. There exist some other examples in the game, but they are encountered rarely or are just a deviation of the kill an enemy concept. Like I said before, these ideas aren't revolutionary, but spice up the gameplay a fair amount. This is a game about responding to your surroundings through creative thinking and strategy. While the combat never once grew stale for me, I can't help but feel the developers didn't put enough effort into the various objectives of a fight. Especially towards the end where I felt all I was doing was killing every single enemy that came in sight rather than anything interesting. Felseal does attempt to provide a side objective when repeating areas you have already completed. It does this by sometimes spawning one of two enemies, either a Zotzit, which gives bonus AP if defeated in battle, or a Dark Kawa Merchant that drops components to be used in crafting items. The goal of these foes is to defeat them quickly as they will despawn after a couple turns. Personally, I never enjoyed seeing these enemies. The Zotzit is an incredibly frustrating monster that leaves a present in the form of a dead party member before it leaves and the Kawa constantly runs behind enemy lines, making it extremely challenging to kill. Oftentimes I just ignore these enemies, especially on higher difficulties. I need to make one thing clear here. I don't think Felseal's fights are boring or all the same. The gameplay is great and always felt satisfying. The purpose of this criticism is to show how I believe the combat could have gone from great to fantastic.
I've been fairly critical for a while, so let's transition onto a concept I think Felseal does better than most other turn-based tactical RPGs. The amount of variety Felseal has in its difficulty customization is fantastic. It's to the point that I wish other games focused more on it because it truly does change the experience playing through the game again. Felseal allows you to directly change the enemy's stats for the current level they are, affect how many foes are present in an encounter, spawn elite type enemies, change how many items the enemy has, and how often they use them. The list goes on. Independently, these options don't seem like a big deal. However, when you combine all of their effects together, you can get something truly special. Usually games do have some of these difficulty options, but Felseal gives you such a wide variety that it sets the game apart. There is one difficulty option that should always be turned on unless you enjoy steamrolling through your games without a challenge. This option is having monsters constantly match your party's level. Felseal has a large number of chests to be found in its areas. Most people will be enticed to return to areas where they either missed a treasure or couldn't obtain it at the time. What this means is your party members will be gaining experience and leveling up while you are doing this, leading to you out-leveling the story encounters in the future. By enabling this setting, you can play to your heart's content without having to worry about destroying the challenge the game provides. Trust me, if you do even a small amount of side content, you will be overleveled. I mentioned earlier that injuries are ineffective because it's easy to go back to previous areas and fight weaker foes to heal them. With this setting enabled, all enemies will scale to your level, making this strategy impossible. Or at least I wish I could say that. The reason is the first real fight of the game will always have its original level scaling no matter what. This means your level 40 war mage can take on the entire group on his own with both legs tied together and a missing arm. Although without this, I believe the game would suffer. I always found it frustrating to have to worry about other party members outside of my main six. They would never gain ability points at the rate I wanted them to, and keeping them on equal footing with other party members led to the overall team not being as effective as I wanted them to be. This could easily be solved by grinding, but since encounters tend to take a lengthy amount of time to complete, it would simply take up too much time. I also hate when games force a player to do any unnecessary grinding as it feels like pointless busy work. The last aspect of gameplay I wanted to discuss is the crafting system. You craft items by mixing together different components. The things you can craft range from rocks that are made of meteors, yeah I don't know either, to ancient armor pieces that apparently any old sap can craft with proper materials. Technique? Who needs it? Honestly, the entire idea feels tacked on and I often found myself forgetting I even had the ability to craft items. The reason for this is the game hands out new crafting materials slower than the rate I make these videos. Without new components, you can't craft anything new, making the system useless the majority of the time. During my first playthrough, when I bothered to remember I could craft things, I would always be left disappointed because I still couldn't craft anything new, or the gear I could craft wasn't even as good as what I already had. Eventually, some of the early craftable items become sold at stores, making the idea even more questionable. Another big issue is a large portion of the gear you can craft for your party members are made using materials that you can only find at the end, meaning mostly the items you can craft aren't even available until you've almost finished the game. I will admit these items are actually extremely useful, and the tools the player can create are the best the game has to offer. My last issue with crafting is how you gather components. The main method is simply playing the game as sometimes enemies will drop materials and completing an encounter also rewards you with some occasionally. This is actually pretty convenient, and my only real issue is what you get from enemies is random, meaning you could lose out on some materials through sheer luck. Another method is harvesting components in the areas where your party participates in combat. Basically, they're a side objective that the player can choose to do if they so wish. I see this as an issue because you only receive one of a component every time you harvest, and you can only harvest a source once per encounter. So to get more of a material, you have to replay content over and over again. This becomes tedious and time consuming, especially if you have enemy level scaling with your level turned on. While I am not a fan of busy work in most games, I will admit this issue is minor. You don't spend that much time crafting items anyway, and this rarely becomes a problem. I do distinctly remember saying I would discuss the story of Felseal, although since I never stopped talking about gameplay you may have forgotten. My opinion on Felseal's story isn't that it was terrible. It was definitely serviceable, but it didn't do anything interesting and felt more like an excuse to have the player travel around fighting monsters rather than anything compelling. My biggest issue with the narrative is the characters. The main heroine, Kairi, is the classic, I can do no wrong, justice is absolute, I'm perfect protagonist. Nothing she says or does is really all that interesting, and you can tell how she is going to react to any and all situations even before the text box appears on your screen. Her gaggle of companions that aren't your personal meat puppets sadly aren't very interesting either. Anadine is a rookie arbiter who somehow has no idea how corrupt the world is, even though every other person in existence seems to have gotten the message by now. Anadine's shining moment in the game is when she is corrupted by dark energy and the player is led to believe this could kill her. 
I actually enjoyed this part of the story because it was treated as a big deal and didn't get solved immediately. However, its conclusion ruins the whole moment for me. Eventually, the dark energy is subdued, but only temporarily, and it's left in the air whether this will have an impact in the future. Sadly, this potential for long-term storytelling is thrown out the window a couple areas later where an immortal deus ex machina is the problem away forever and it is never mentioned again. Ugh. <sighs> At least Anadine got a unique class out of the experience. The other party member I will go into detail about is Raynor. Raynor acts as Kyrie's partner, and is essentially the group's second-in-command. It also helps that he is probably the best character in the entire game. Often he is used as the comic relief, constantly throwing out one-liners which can be entertaining at times, although when the time comes he throws away the routine for a more serious tone. This is especially true in scenes involving his deceased wife. You see, Raynor deeply regrets not being by her side when she passed away, an event that still haunts him. This trauma causes him to always want to be by Kyrie's side, as she was adopted into his family at a young age, making him see her as a sister. Rainer never wants to experience the pain of losing someone precious to him again, and will always be around to make sure it never happens. This culminates with Rainer sacrificing himself in one of the game's endings to seal the Maw, which is the evil monster that terrorized the world in case you forgot. This sacrifice is built up over the course of the game as you learn more about Rainer and the regrets he has in life towards his wife. Sadly, his death is telegraphed so obviously that it damages the moment. Players oftentimes aren't idiots, and it upsets me when a game doesn't respect the intelligence of its audience. This tends to be more of an industry-wide issue, and since this isn't a commentary on the problem, I'm going to drop it here. Despite the hiccup, Rainer's death is done well enough, and I was definitely sad to see him go. The other three party members, Yates, Katja, and Bizarro, have the spotlight shown on them when they first join the party, but swiftly lose relevance once the narrative progresses. They become more and more like the brick walls the rest of your party is made up of as the game progresses, only for them to jump back to relevance every once in a while. Seriously, sometimes they didn't appear in a cutscene for such a long period of time, I forgot they existed. Only for them to appear shaking their heads back and forth doing sweet F.A. every once in a while. Since the number of story characters that make up your party is already limited, it feels as if the game is lacking a proper cast outside of the three main heroes. The other characters I wanted to discuss are the villains. I'll also be using them to transition into other events that transpire throughout the game. Felsiel is pretty indecisive, as it can't seem to decide which character is the puppet doing its master's bidding, and which one is the true man behind it all. The first nefarious goon is a haunty noble named Alphonse. He reeks of what I call pointless side villain that doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. And oh look, that's exactly what he is. He embodies the power-hungry noble that doesn't care about anybody else and is swiftly killed off in the beginning. After this, your party wanders around the continent, completing the pilgrimage that the candidates have to undertake by visiting four temples and absorbing the dark energy stored there. Along this journey, the player encounters a group against the tyranny of the immortals called Sigil. For some reason, they are trying to stop you from advancing along the pilgrimage, so they instantly become your adversaries. Somehow these guys are the villains, even though they protect cities from bandit attacks, while the Arbiters ally themselves with the bandits for a quick buck. Why are we fighting them again? Oh, the reason is because the organization's leader, Rafe, is actually using dark energy and demons to fulfill the group's goal, and somehow none of the members are aware of this. This is where the narrative becomes particularly weak. Alphonse was a decent villain for the beginning of the game, but after that there really isn't a clear adversary and the party's goal is to mindlessly advance through the pilgrimage. This is the weakest part of the narrative and a consistent theme throughout the game. It's obvious to anyone with a pulse that the pilgrimage is really hiding some grand conspiracy, However, our heroes don't attempt to do anything about it, and follow along blindly. Tiora is meant to be so corrupted that justice hardly exists, but Kairi's understanding of this corruption fluctuates. One moment she's going to a different city because she knows Alphonse will buy his freedom in their current location, and the next she's surprised Arbiters are siding with bandits. The opening scene blatantly tells the player the Arbiters are corrupted, so why are we wasting time with Kairi and Ko being so shocked? Kairi believes in the will of the council to a fault and never outright questions their rule, even though it's obvious that their policies have led to the world they currently live in. None of the protagonists seem to think for themselves, and instead blindly follow a system that is obviously flawed. Moving back to the events of the story, the party continues the pilgrimage, clashing with Sigil along the way. Rafe drains the dark energy from the third temple and reveals he's associated with summoning demons. You may ask about the second temple. Well, Nothing all that interesting happens. You beat up some sigil guys guarding the temple, absorb some energy from the shrine, and leave. Nothing else happens. After the events of the third temple, Kyrie chases after Rafe all the way back to the beginning area of the game. From here, one of the immortals, Septimus, attempts to have your group assassinated. 
I probably should have mentioned Septimus earlier, but he has such little impact on the story that I couldn't find the right time to mention him. Basically, he is the one who picked Alphonse to become a candidate, and has been having bandits attack cities to stir up chaos. Or something. The party defeats Septimus, and the other immortals intervene. Now something ridiculous happens here. The other immortals know that Septimus is guilty, but refuse to do anything about it because it's Septimus' word over Kyrie's. This guy just attempted to blatantly murder a group of people in the streets of a city where there were apparently no witnesses and nobody is going to do anything about it. What about the bodies of all the assassins we just killed? I understand the government is corrupt, but this is just too much suspension of disbelief. I would at least try to put the guy on lockdown so something like this doesn't happen again. Instead, they just let him go and move on like nothing happened. Just continue on our pilgrimage, Kyrie. The always just council will solve this problem. Don't you worry. Unbelievable. Once this catastrophe finishes, you travel to the final temple and clash with Rafe after he drains the temple of its dark energy. Finally, Rafe explains who he is and why he's on his crusade. He was an arbiter that had his partner, Sylvia, sent on a suicide mission because she called the council out on their corrupt antics. This partner happens to be Kyrie's mentor and Anadine's mother. I didn't mention this earlier because up until this point, Sylvia had been mentioned only a handful of times. She really wasn't important, and this reveal literally comes out of left field. This is supposed to make Rafe be seen as a tragic villain, turned to hatred for the crimes done against him. The issue is, Sylvia didn't really matter up until this point, and while what happened to him is tragic, I couldn't find myself caring. A twist like this needs to be handled carefully. There needs to be some form of foreshadowing that makes the audience care. The foreshadowing can't be extremely obvious, or it loses its impact, while if there is none, people tend to feel nothing. After these events, you stand tall over Rafe, and Primus, the council member that planned on stepping down way in the beginning appears, takes the absorbed dark energy for himself, and it is revealed he has been working with Sigil all along to obtain all the energy at each temple, granting him immense power. Hold on, I have to take a step back for a moment. The guy in charge of Sigil, an organization that wants to depose the council's rule, is siding with a member of said council. I have to check with my slaves, I mean, uh, the script writers. This cannot be correct. Hmm. Uh-huh. Yes. You- you can't be serious. What? So, uh, they're serious. Anyway, you chase after Primus and Rafe, and are confronted by Septimus and another immortal that doesn't really matter who are siding with Primus. Septimus takes this moment to explain his grand evil scheme. Has Primus offered him some great power or some other nonsense? Did he have bandits attack cities for a reason? No. No, he didn't. It's revealed that Septimus is just inhuman garbage that likes to watch the world burn. He's even okay with being Primus's lapdog. He did it all just because he enjoyed it. If you listen really closely, you can hear his entire character being flushed down the toilet. The world has done a favor in the form of Septimus's death, and you move on to confront Primus. Primus explains the reason for his actions are the council is ineffective, and that people like Septimus can even become immortals. The system is flawed, and can only be corrected through a strong central leader like himself. Hey, at least he's right about the corruption of the council, but I'm not too keen on the whole dictator with so much power that no one can question him aspect. Primus absorbs the last of the dark energy in the immortal council chamber, and you square up for a fight. Rafe ends up betraying him by literally stabbing him in the back, and Primus is defeated. This causes him to succumb to all the dark energy inside him, transforming him into the Maw. It may seem a little odd that Primus becomes the Maw, but there's a good explanation. The Immortals never defeated the beast, but instead sealed it away using all the various relics found in all the temples. To ensure the seal does not break, the Immortals have to periodically drain the dark energy from these relics, giving them amazing power and ridiculously long lifespans. Yes, the reason why the Immortals are so strong is because they are using the power of the Maw. I enjoyed this twist because it seems fitting that the strong central theme of corruption is rooted in the very leaders themselves that are supposed to usher in peace using that dark power. It encapsulates that the very root of the world's problems come from the ones enforcing the rules. Once Primus is dealt with, Rafe's grand scheme is finally brought to light. He planned on bringing back the Maw, bending it to his will, and using the power to overthrow the Immortals, creating a new society in the process. Hmm, sole dictator using dark power to change society? Have we been here before? I feel like we've been here before. Except the problem is the Maw isn't too keen on playing puppet to Rafe and runs away. Soon after, Kyrie has her final confrontation with Rafe, where after failing to control the Maw, he laments on how foolish he was and regrets his actions before dying. You move to confront the Maw, and depending on some optional content, get one of two endings. One ending is resealing the Maw, causing Raynor to sacrifice his life to achieve this goal. This leads to Kyrie becoming an immortal, causing her to become corrupted by the dark energy coursing through her, and Anadine reforming Sigil to find a way to stop the Maw for good. The other is defeating the Maw forever, and hopefully ushering in a period of peace and justice. 
Huh, <sighs> that was a lot of information. I have some other complaints besides what I've already mentioned. Felseal can't seem to decide who the main villain should be. It goes from Alphonse, to Rafe, to kind of Septimus, to Primus, back to Rafe, and then finally the Maw. I'm not really a fan of the whole real villain coming out of the shadows cliche to begin with, but this is just excessive. My other complaint is how the members of Sigil don't seem to care that their supposedly righteous leader is using demons and dark arts to achieve his goals. This information is kept hidden from them, and once they find out, none of them care at all. They literally shout, FOR THE CAUSE, and attack you. Hey guys, you wanna join my party? I've got plenty of mindless followers with no personality. You'd fit right in. My last issue is the overall theme of the story. The main driving theme of Felsil is the corruption plaguing Tiora. While I like the mob being the root of everything, the laws created by the Immortals would have caused these problems to begin with. Seriously, who thought it was a good idea to give Arbiters complete jurisdiction over the law? You're just asking for people to bribe them. I spent a considerable amount of time criticizing the story, and while I don't believe it does much all that well, it isn't terrible. Sure, it's filled with plenty of cliché moments and the writing is mediocre at best, but despite all these flaws, I still believe it is serviceable, although I wouldn't recommend the game solely based on it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's all I have to say about Felseal Arbiter's Mark. While the game definitely has its downs, I believe its positives heavily outweigh them. The sheer amount of customization available to the player is remarkable, and allows them to have a unique experience even on subsequent playthroughs. The combat is truly enjoyable, and I would recommend this game to anyone that is a fan of the genre, as you will definitely enjoy it. As you probably already know, the worst part of Felseal is the story. I just finished explaining everything, so I'll let those points speak for themselves. The last thing I wanted to say is a thank you to you, the viewer. I greatly appreciate you watching the video all the way to the end. It means a lot. I hope to see you again, and have a great day.